Well, good morning and happy new year to you. I know I'm a week late, but I was out last week, and so uh, thank you for allowing me and Daniel filling in. I know he does an incredible job, but I went to Florida and got to visit my, my mom and my sister, and so uh, had a blast and really glad to be back with you. You need to know, as your pastor, that, that I miss you. I genuinely miss our time our fellowship together, and, and my heart longs just to be back with you. Um, and so happy new year, very excited about this year and what the Lord is going to continue to do in our midst, right? We have a lot to celebrate. We have a lot to rejoice over. Do, do you sense God moving amongst us? Yeah, you can say it a little more enthusiastically than that. Huh? <laughs> Take that off the notes. That really fell short in the first service. Yes, God is moving amongst us. God is doing great things, all right? Uh, and so we want to see more and more of that. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 6, okay? We're going to continue our walk through our journey through the book of Acts, all right? So let me give you a refresher because this is all the way uh, before Thanksgiving, and you have probably forgotten, some of you, right, almost everything we covered. Here's your refresher crash course, right? Remember, 1-8 is the thesis for the book of Acts. Jesus tells the disciples, go back to Jerusalem and wait, okay? Wait, because the Holy Spirit is going to fall upon you, okay? And you will be my witnesses, because you're going to receive power that comes from the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and even to the ends of the earth, right? The gospel will go forward. Okay, so we've seen that thread, that repeated thread of, of what the Spirit does, but another really important thread that we've covered, and this is going to go all the way through chapter 7, so in, in what we cover next week, and that is that a massive shift has occurred, and that is that the Spirit of God no longer dwells in a building in the, the old temple, the uh, Solomon's temple or Herod's temple. Now, the Spirit of God dwells within his people. And, and one of the things that Luke does is this stark contrast between the new living temple versus the old temple. Because he tells, or, or there, there's this constant movement where the early church goes to the temple courtyard, stands and preaches and teaches and proclaims the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, the Spirit gives them a special miracle where, where there is a man who is lame from birth that everyone knew, and, and Peter and John heal him, okay? Okay. And, and they got to preach the good news of Jesus all day long, and thousands come to faith. Well, as that is happening, uh, everyone gets, the, the, the temple uh, and all the leaders get really upset, and they press against them, right? Uh, but Peter and John are going to be arrested, and then the 12, uh, all 12 disciples, the apostles, because they had daily set up in the temple, they too are going to be arrested, but when they're arrested and thrown in jail, an angel comes and in the middle of the night releases them, but gives them specific instructions. Go right back to the temple and keep preaching and proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. And so you ask the question, well, how did the early church, how did they respond to threats and to arrest and to beatings? They run to God, right? Right? The, the way that they are supposed to, they run to God and the Holy Spirit continually fills them with boldness. They even rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. That's what it says in 541. And the church grew, right? The gospel exploded and Every day they were meeting in the temple and from house to house, and they did not stop preaching and teaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Chapter 5, verse 42. But Satan doesn't simply attack Jesus' church from the outside. 
as we will see in our text this morning, maybe he can poison the well from within. Listen, as I read Acts chapter 6, the first seven verses. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that and make that as a gift from us to you. I'm going to be reading out of the New American Standard Version, and it'll be on the board for you. All right, so now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable or not right for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now the statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and, and Procurus, and Nic uh, Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these that they had brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid hands on them. Look at verse 7. And the word of God kept on spreading. And the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, what an honor and privilege it is to call you Father. Father, we pause right now to rejoice in the fact that you have saved us, and we know you through faith in your son, Jesus Christ, that you had given him for us, that we could know you and walk with you, that your spirit is within us and that we are your living temple. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you for your word. We pray this morning that as we read your word and as we, we contemplate what the church is supposed to be about and some of the complexity and infighting that can happen within the church, God, we pray that you would speak to us. We pray that we would be mindful and obedient to do all that you require and desire for us to do. Father, we pray that we would have our hearts knit together in a commitment to care for one another as your word calls us to do. And that that unity would shine a light into the darkness around us in a divided world that they would see our love for one another. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, now before we get started, I, I want you to notice something that Luke does here. The way that he brackets this passage in verse one and verse seven with growth. Okay, look at that. Now, now, at this time, the disciples were increasing in number. That's verse one, right? And then verse seven, and the word of God kept on spreading, okay? Continued to increase greatly. Guys, Luke wants us to be encouraged, excited that the gospel is going forward. Right, And it is good and it is right for you and I to dream in these terms. Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come. He tells the apostles, you will be my witnesses. The gospel will go to the ends of the earth. So as we look at our text this morning, we're going to notice that an issue will arise. That if unresolved could actually derail the growth of the early church. Verse one, now at this time, the disciples were increasing in number and a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now we are within the first year or second year of the church. 
Remember, it is almost exclusively Jewish and based there in Jerusalem. Now, even still, that doesn't mean that there is not diversity or divides within. Now, one of those cultural divides is between the Hellenist and the Hebrews. Now, the Hellenists that Luke refers to here, they were Jews by birth, but they had adopted many Roman customs from their neighbors. Okay, so they still worshiped in the temple. They still came to the festivals. They still believed in the God of the Bible, but they had assimilated into Roman culture where they could. Okay, they dressed like the Gentiles. They socialized with the culture. They embraced the Roman government, and they had adopted Greek as their primary language. Now, the Hebrews, on the other hand, were much more traditionally Jewish in their dress and their customs and their manner of life. They, had, they held to the rabbinic teachings on what to eat, particular washings and do not touch and who they socialized with and the way that they conducted business. And the Hebrews spoke Aramaic, which is a derivative of Hebrew, while again, the Hellenists spoke Greek. You see, the Hebrews, they were separatists and they insulated themselves against the Gentile community. They were traditional. They were conservatives. Now, the Hellenists, they attempted to assimilate into Greco-Roman culture. They tried to accommodate wherever possible without abandoning their Jewish faith. They were moderate or liberal. Go with the times. Now, does any of this sound familiar? You see, these divides exist in every culture. Jerusalem is predominantly Hebrew. But when Pentecost happens, because you would travel from all over the empire, the Hellenists have come in. They have traveled to celebrate at Pentecost. And what happens at Pentecost? The Holy Spirit of God falls and we now become the temple. But there's this miracle where the language, everyone is able to hear in their own native dialects. And both Hebrews and Hellenists are saved. Right there, they're both saved. And the togetherness has been amazing. And the generosity, astounding. Evidence that the Holy Spirit of God is moving amongst them. And believers like Barnabas have sold off additional pieces of property, laid the money at the apostles' feet so that the poor among them could be cared for. And the gospel is moving through every status in society, but especially the poor. And so the church began a daily food program. Sounds like a good idea, right? So now imagine what this would look like. Daily food program. They don't have packaged food. Okay, They're not picking up cans of green beans and going, here, heat it yourself. They're going to the market. They're purchasing fruits and vegetables. They're baking breads. Okay, And then they're, they're setting up tables and serving lines where the poorest among them could come and get a daily meal in order to survive. In the ancient world, you survived daily. Now, through selflessness and generosity and a lot of hard work, the church is living out God's command of Deuteronomy 14, 28 and 29. That is that, that part of the offerings that were given to the priests, they, they were supposed to take some of that and they were supposed to give that to the poor, to the most vulnerable, and especially widows. Because in the ancient world, very few women owned land or businesses. And without a husband, once a woman was too old to bear hard labor, she was vulnerable of starving to death. 
This is why God gives the instructions. Care for the foreigner, care for the orphan, and care for the widow. All right, and so daily now, with the money that has been laid at the, at the apostles' feet, widows and other poor are coming to get a hot meal served by a team of volunteers. And you say, what a witness to the community. And they all lived happily ever after. Right? Amen. Let's go home. Isn't it amazing that what you start with good intentions, it just always goes smoothly. Praise the Lord. No, it says, verse 1, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews. Why? Because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now, let me remind you that they didn't have a suggestion box in this early church. Okay, this is a church. This is a community. So how do you think that complaint arose? Well, imagine, right? You've been in churches. Well, apparently, the Hellenists were sitting off on one side. They're sitting there together. And they didn't feel like they were getting as much food as the Hebrews. Maybe they were served last, Maybe their food was cold by then. Or, or worse, maybe it had all run out. And after a few days or weeks of this, there is grumbling. Talk within the community. All right? How does that sound? All the servers are Hebrews. And I don't like the way that they look at me. Right? They only serve their kind of food, and we get less. It's like, it's like we're the dogs, and they just give us the scraps. You know, I don't like that Mary. She's always smirking as she blows off her, her, her uh, hot soup, and, and she looks at me because she knows mine will be cold. And then suddenly when the church gathers together, these groups are no longer mingled, they're separated. And now the complaining starts with the song selection. Why don't we ever sing any songs in Greek? All the apostles are Hebrew. Do they even really want us here? You see, for Luke to record this for us and to place it right here, you must understand, guys, this is a big deal. There's a genuine rift that's occurred in the church. Is the church going to be just like the wilderness generation that quickly turned on its leadership and became known for grumbling and complaining? Is the Spirit of God going to be quenched among them? At its deepest level... This divide is about even more because it questions the very foundations of the gospel. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female for all are one in Christ Jesus. See, the gospel says there are no second class citizens that there is one spirit, one baptism, one family. And at the root here, the question is, is the gospel able not only to save, but to bring together those who are divided in the world? Can the gospel do that? Is the gospel greater than our different opinions and cultures and preferences? This is exactly what Jesus prayed for in John 17, when he prayed for unity to be among. I pray that the unity that we have, that they would have, because then, this is what Jesus says in John 17, then the world will know that you sent me, Father, that Jesus is the Christ. The world will know based on the unity that exists amongst us. Now, pause for a second. Let's ask the question, where did this conflict come from? Because the Spirit of God has been moving mightily. Was the church doing something that it shouldn't? 
No. Did the apostles show poor leadership? No. Guys, these are just growing pains of reaching out to a broken world. Unity and gospel community are not the absence of struggle and conflict. You see, the evidence that the Spirit is amongst us is the ability to overcome and to solve. To grow in spiritual maturity is to persevere. Did you hear that? This is profound, very important. Because you're not called to go look and find a church that has absolutely no strife. True story, I get to sit down as one of my privileges of the job and do pre-marriage counseling. And they sit across from me and they give each other those butterfly eyes and giggle and say sweet nothings back and forth. True story, there's one we always have to get to. All right, let's, let's talk about handling conflict. Uh, tell me about your last fight. Uh, we've never had a fight. Um, tell me about your differences of opinion. I, I can't really think of any. I, I mean, do you mean like she likes seafood and I don't? I wanted to say, go have a fight and then come back so we can deal with something. You don't hear that scenario and think, you know what? They are so mature. They are just perfect for each other. You hear that and you say, I hope they have what it takes when real life hits. Because it's the same with the church. Church is a family. You believe that? That we are committed to each other. And guess what? Family gets messy. It has to. And the evidence that the Spirit is working amongst us is not the absence of conflict, but the ability to work through it and to be unified on the other side. That actually displays to a lost and dying world, Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God because He can unify that which the world divides. Verse 2, so the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, guys, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Now, naturally with conflict, everyone wants to know, well, what are the leadership going to do about this? What are the 12 apostles how are they going to fix this? Now, there are a number of important leadership lessons to point out here. I want you to notice that they don't get defensive or deflect. All right? Hey, well, it's not our fault. Notice they don't go on the offensive and seek to discredit the accusation. You know, you guys are just making a big deal out of this when there's really nothing there. Now, the program is important, and finding a solution is vital. Now, apparently, there had been a growing suggestion that the apostles should now lead it. Now, on the surface, this, uh, on the surface, this isn't a bad thing. The 12 aren't above the task. I mean, Jesus washed their feet and said, go and do likewise. The greatest in the kingdom are servants. Okay, So on the surface, this isn't beneath them. But when they gather the congregation together, we learn that the time commitment of a daily food program would be too much. It would pull them away, and they would neglect studying the Scripture. And so their reply is, it is not right. That's what the ESV and the NIV say. It is not right for us to neglect the Word of God in order to serve tables. Now, when the Bible says it is not good or it is not right for them to neglect the word, here's an important question. It's not good for who? For who? I mean, is Peter saying, look, guys, I need more personal time in my quiet time. I need to have a good solid five hours or I just can't make it through the day. 
Is that what he's saying? Who is it not good for? Well, the entire church. The entire church. That's what he's saying. It's not good for the entire church if the word of God is neglected by those who are charged to preach and teach. Look at this thread through the book of Acts. The scriptures are on, are, are on the screen. Look at 242. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 542. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And then in our passage here today, look at the way that Luke frames all three of these things. In verse uh, 6, 2, he says, it is not right, it is not right for us to neglect the word of God. In 6, 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And in 6, 7, after the conclusion, he says, the word of God kept on spreading. Do you see the emphasis? Now, notice, they didn't need to study in order that they could evangelize. They were doing quite well at that. And why did they need to study? In order to teach and to feed the people of God. Feed them what? The word of God. That's what you're supposed to be fed. And, and serious thought and exposition of the scripture, hours of study and prayer are what is needed. It is not right for the word of God to be neglected. Several years ago, I took the youth on a mission trip. We went out of state and we did some, some homeless ministry. And all week long, uh, I kept hearing about this new church in town. And we had to go. They were doing amazing things. They were blowing up. They were reaching. They were just, it was awesome. You had to go. And we got there, and it, it happened to be in a movie theater. And the song service began, and we were singing cover songs, of secular songs. And the person next to me said, oh, isn't this great? Last week, they sang a Matchbox 20 song, and that was absolutely my favorite. And then this week, we sang a song from the 70s, Jackson Brown's Running on Empty. Because it was leading into the sermon about, hey, aren't you burned out? Aren't you tired? So pause and think about this for just a second. We're not singing to God. Instead, we're singing about our own plights. And then for the sermon, we watched movie clips, four different movie clips. And, and, and then the movie clip is paused, and then, and then we're told a little bit of practical application in Christianese about the movie and applying this to your life. I shudder to imagine that pastor watching movie clips all week thinking, Start here, stop here, insert Jesus juke here. Now, I know that's an extreme example. But I don't think it's too far whenever you think about some of the priorities that have begun to creep into our culture. That we become convinced that people need to focus on themselves rather than God. And need to be spoon-fed, fun application. Guys, but God has revealed himself in his word. His words are life. These are his stories, his instructions, his analogies. He's the one that said that I have been chosen from the foundation of the world. He's the one that says I am an adopted child of God. He's the one that's, that calls me redeemed, a term that means I'm a purchased POW that he has ransomed back. 
He's the one that says that the church is his bride. These are God's analogies, his instruction. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. It will not return to him void. And we say, yeah, but I'd rather watch a movie clip. It is not right to neglect the word of God. So beloved, this text this morning gives us two very important guideposts, okay, for what the church must be about. Number one, guys, serious theology, preaching and teaching of God's word, rolling up our sleeves and understanding what God has said and the context that he has said it and to understand all of those things and that the people of God need to be fed his word in order to raise up disciples that follow Jesus and can withstand the troubles and tribulations of life. Now, this does not only include the ordained pastoral staff, but certainly it is our primary responsibility, and it must not be neglected, and you as a congregation must demand that it is so. You must demand it. If you're not a member here and you're visiting, you're going back somewhere else, you must demand that you be fed, that the people of God be fed the word of God. And it's not simply me. All right, it's Daniel and Gary do considerable teaching. I often get asked how many weeks or how many hours of my week uh, get spent on preparing Sunday morning's message. Typically 16 to 20 hours, half of my week to study and to pray over, to write out, to feed you God's word. When Garrett stands before the youth, what do you think he should preach and teach? Do you show movie clips? Let's feed them God's word. It is good and it is right and it is what we must do. Secondly, the other guidepost that must be, that the church must be about. We must care for one another. The early church didn't abandon care for one another whenever things got complicated. Right, so we're a long ways from those first days when there were only 120 disciples in the, other, in the upper room, right? When everyone had access to the 12, weren't those the glory days? Everyone could just ask Peter a question. And everyone spoke the same language, and most of them were from Galilee. Now there are thousands. There is diversity. The 12 are removed, and division has occurred but pause and look on the positive side. Because if they can get organized, look at the care ministry that they can provide. Right? They couldn't run a food program when there are only 120 of them. Did you know one of the amazing things that God has done around here over the past year is to be able to raise up two really important care ministries, our foster care ministry and our special needs ministry over the last year have just really begun to form and take, take root. These are very important ministries, but in reality, they're difficult. And we praise God for this on what we can do because of we are in this together. So when they're met with complexity and division, what did they do? They rose up the first deacons in order to continue the care ministry. A couple of important details that I can only mention this morning. I want you to notice that the congregation appointed its own leaders. The apostles didn't go, look, we're putting these seven in charge. Guys, this is a fundamental principle to the function of the church. Next, I want you to also notice that all seven names of the deacons are Greek names. It doesn't mean that, that Jews didn't have Greek names, but here in this context, it is pretty obvious that they are giving overwhelming to support to the Hellenists. 
And notice that Nicholas wasn't even Jewish. It calls him a proselyte. That means that he was a non-Jew who had converted to Judaism. And now to Jesus. You see, the whole congregation gave dignity and honor to the minority group that was previously slighted. And look at the end results. The word of God kept on spreading. And the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Why does Luke mention at the end, there were a great number of priests who became believers? Well, there's two reasons. If you go back a little earlier, the Sadducees were the predominant priests. And they were adamantly opposed to the message. They, they were coming out the strongest, particularly the leaders at the, at the top. That's in 4-1. Okay, So one, you're now seeing that group change. But secondly, in the Old Testament, do you know who was in charge of passing out the food to the poor and caring for them? It was the priests. So what they are seeing now is that the new living temple is able to reach out and is able to overcome all those divides and is able to care for people in a way that the old temple and the old system was never able to do so. The new living temple is being obedient and is accomplishing more than ever before. What an incredible witness to the community that there is unity over what the world divides, that they are caring for the most vulnerable, and that there is incredible generosity and faithful teaching, that all of that is occurring. So let me give you a quick summary of actually something that we have walked through as a church. Did you know that a year ago at this time, we still had a a committee that we had formed together called a tiger team because we were wrestling through asking questions about church membership. You see, we had inflated roles. We had people that we didn't know if they actually attended and all sorts of things. And we really wanted to take the Bible seriously and say, you know what? Membership matters and our care for one another matters. So we began to ask important questions to roll up our sleeves and have these difficult conversations. And we went through a journey together as a church. Now, we had task force that rolled up their sleeves and made phone calls to 1,000 people and cleaned up a ton of the roles. Then in addition to that, last February, we instituted deacon care. That is this belief, this structure that every member of the church, every family unit has a deacon that is there to help be that safety net that catches, that makes sure they don't fall through the cracks. That care in our church primarily happens in our growth groups. But deacons, we want someone to have a deacon who will call them, who will pray for them, who will know them. That if there's any complications or issues, they have someone to go to. As an extension arm of the pastors, living out Act 6 right here. And so our stats of this morning, we have 1,475 members of our church and 643 family units, and those are divided over 70 deacons. Let me just pause and tell you that behind the scenes, these guys have worked hard contacting families. It hasn't been easy. We cleaned up the roles as much as we could, but then they had to get a list of families. They had to make contacts introducing themselves. Some of you, you know, if you don't recognize a number, you don't answer. It, we, we have all those fun conversations. Like, keep pressing on, guys. This is important for us as a church. Keep reaching out and praying for families and helping them get connected within the life of our church. 
Because this is so important. This is what God wants us to be about. In our fast-paced society, we're a large church to, to still care for one another. And there are so many stories that I could tell you about a deacon who called at just the right time to pray for my family. Deacons walking with families through difficulties, making sure that they're cared for in the, in the case of a death for a family. Stories of even doing some manual labor and helping out at, at an elderly home. Now, I know, don't say that, don't say that. Don't remind them that we can do that. Yeah. Think of all the things that deacons do. They handle the benevolence requests. They serve faithfully here on Sundays by, by greeting, by uh, doing the golf carts, by serving the Lord's Supper. Uh, a short time ago, we had our Acts 6 widow and widower's banquet. You see, this year, this organization... We've taken a massive steps forward as the deacons being the extension of the pastoral staff to make sure that we are cared for as a church, that we know each other, that we're praying for one another. And it's not perfect and, and there are still complications, but we are striving. And, and let me pause and also say that the deacons' wives had, have had to carry much of the same load. And so I stand before you and tell you, guys, I'm very proud of our deacon body. I'm honored to be their pastor, and I'm grateful for the culture of care that exists within our church. I want you guys to know that. All right, so where does this leave us today as we close? Well, I think it's a perfect Sunday for us to remember these two important pillars of what the church must be about, the preaching and teaching of God's word and the care for one another, the unity that exists amongst us. Also important for us to remember the importance of church membership. So I'm going to ask for you to stand right now where you are, if you would stand and I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer as we pray over this commitment, commitment to God's word and commitment to love and to care for one another. If you are a visitor here this morning, I just want you to, to consider the importance of church membership, the value of it. And, and what it says about the gospel, okay? So you just contemplate. You can pray with us even if you're a member, all right? So guys, let's just pray and let's renew our commitment. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the local church. We thank you, King Jesus, that you have died to create the local church and that you put your Holy Spirit inside of us and that when we gather together, there is a unique expression of your spirit where we are the living temple, your bride. Father, would you give us a renewed commitment and hunger and thirst for your word? Help us to memorize it. Help us to think well of it. Help us to, to demand that we be fed your word. Teach us. Give us knowledge of you. Not for knowledge's sake, but so that we can know you. That the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened with who you are. And Father, as a church, will you continue to help us grow in our love and care for one another. That we would carry each other's burdens, whether it be financial, physical, health-related, spiritual, emotional. That we would not walk alone, but linked arm in arm, your light through our church 
as your people would shine into the darkness because the world longs to have this sort of unity. God, help us to grow in that. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. As the praise team comes up and leads us in a final song, you are invited to respond. Whatever form or fashion the Holy Spirit has laid upon your heart. We have some ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you want to use these steps or the stage as an altar to pour out your heart before the Lord. If you, going into this new year, you want to bring your family forward and you just want to pray as a group, okay, of, of what God is going to continue to do. If you want to pray for our church about what God is going to continue to do. Whatever the Lord has placed upon your heart, you be obedient this morning.